Preoperative fasting refers to the period leading up to a medical procedure when a patient avoids all foods and beverages. In other words, it's a specific window before an intervention when a patient is nil per os, or NPO, which is a Latin phrase that translates to nothing by mouth. For many years, patients have been required to be NPO after midnight, meaning the preoperative fast must start at 12 a.m. on the day of the procedure, regardless of when it's scheduled to begin. However, this practice isn't consistent with what's recommended by several professional organizations. The purpose of this video is to review why preoperative fasting is necessary, explore the rationale for an NPO after midnight policy, and highlight the most recent practice guidelines on this topic. In doing so, the goal is to answer the question, should patients be NPO after midnight? Preoperative fasting is centered around reducing the risk of pulmonary aspiration with anesthesia. Anesthetics are medications that reduce awareness and sensation, so procedures can be completed without the patient experiencing pain. Pulmonary aspiration occurs with the inhalation of a foreign material into the airway or lungs. In this case, that includes the gastric contents or secretions from the upper gastrointestinal tract and nasal cavity. Under normal circumstances, patients keep the lungs free of these materials through a coordinated effort between the lower esophageal sphincter, the upper esophageal sphincter, and protective reflexes like expiration and coughing. But with the induction of anesthesia, there's relaxation of the sphincters and a loss of protective reflexes, and therefore a significant increase in the risk of aspiration. Consequences of aspiration include pneumonitis and pneumonia, which are caused by chemical damage from gastric contents and bacterial contamination of the airway and lungs, respectively. These contribute to a decreased ability to deliver oxygen to tissues to varying degrees, with the most severe cases resulting in asphyxiation and death. By limiting the intake of solids and liquids leading up to a procedure that requires anesthesia, it decreases the amount of gastric contents present and makes it less likely that any of these events occur. Considering the justification for a preoperative fast, it's easy to believe the practice of NPO after midnight is supported by a large body of evidence, yet this doesn't appear to be the case. The current understanding of gastric emptying is that water and low-calorie liquids pass into the small intestine at such a fast rate that if they're consumed alone, 0% will remain in the stomach after 2-3 to three hours. High-calorie liquids empty a little bit slower, but are still nearly completely emptied after 3 hours. Solids empty the slowest, with digestible solids remaining in the stomach for between 3 and 4 hours, and indigestible solids remain there for approximately six hours. So, in theory, a patient should be able to safely drink liquids approximately three hours before the induction of anesthesia, and safely eat solids approximately six hours before the induction of anesthesia. While the latter hasn't been examined in research to any significant degree, the former is supported by a number of randomized controlled trials dating back to the 1980s, many of which are included in a 2003 systematic review by Brady et al. This review of 22 randomized controlled trials found that patients who drink clear liquids 2 to 3 hours before a procedure have no increased risk of aspiration or regurgitation when compared to patients who undergo an overnight fast. All of the trials were in healthy patients who were considered to be at low risk of aspiration. Thus, the results shouldn't be applied to patients with anatomical or physiological alterations to the upper gastrointestinal tract, especially those that affect gastric emptying. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you check out the companion piece for it, which you can purchase on its own, or you can receive as part of a 5-pack with publications for warfarin and vitamin K, appetite stimulants, Kyolic, and gout. The links for both products are down in the video description. At this stage, we've seen that a preoperative fast is necessary, but that an overnight fast may be unnecessary. 
That begs the question, why does NPO After Midnight still exist? Unfortunately, there's no simple answer, though it seems to exist more out of tradition than anything else. According to a review of the history of preoperative fasting by J. Roger Maltby, an anesthesiologist who's regarded as a pioneer in this field of study, recommendations for NPO after midnight started appearing in the literature in the 1940s and became rooted in practice by the 1970s. From there, it's been passed down through generations of clinicians and accepted as truth in much the same way other practices are, such as using albumin as a marker of nutritional status. With that being said, arguments for the continued use of NPO after midnight include the following. It's simple and straightforward for staff to recommend to patients. It's easy for patients to understand. It allows for flexibility in scheduling if there are cancellations or if cases need to be rearranged, and it leaves plenty of time for gastric emptying in patients at high risk of aspiration, like those with uncontrolled reflux, gastroparesis, hiatal hernia, or a previous gastric surgery. Nevertheless, these advantages must be carefully weighed against the possible disadvantages. For one, as has already been discussed, it may be unnecessary since an overnight fast tends to be longer than is required for gastric emptying to occur and hasn't been shown to offer any benefit to aspiration risk. An overnight fast has also been shown to be less favorable to well-being with patients reporting more hunger, more thirst, and overall less satisfaction than patients who are allowed to drink clear liquids until two hours before a procedure. Finally, making a patient NPO after midnight may be a missed opportunity to reduce risk of complications from surgery. A longer fasting period raises the concern for an increased risk of dehydration, which can lead to worse outcomes. In addition to this, it ignores the growing body of literature that supports preoperative carbohydrate loading. This practice involves the ingestion of a carbohydrate containing oral solution up to two hours before surgery with the goal of mitigating the stress response and insulin resistance caused by it. The mechanism of action for carbohydrate loading is beyond the scope of this video, but simply put, it appears to offer benefits like improved wound healing and maintenance of lean body mass. That brings us to the official position of professional organizations on this topic. As you will see, there are multiple organizations who have published practice guidelines for preoperative fasting. Still, no organization has been cited more often in research than the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Over the past 25 years, the American Society of Anesthesiologists has published four sets of practice guidelines with recommendations for preoperative fasting. The ones that are most relevant for clinicians today are from 2017 and 2023. In the 2017 practice guidelines, the American Society of Anesthesiologists investigated the optimal fasting times for clear liquids, such as water, black coffee and tea, and juice without pulp, a light meal, which they define as consisting of clear liquids and toast, and a heavier meal, which they mentioned to include fried foods, fatty foods, or meat. They recommended a preoperative fasting time of 2 hours for clear liquids, six hours for a light meal, and eight hours or more for a heavier meal. Then in the 2023 practice guidelines, the American Society of Anesthesiologists looked into the risks and benefits of carbohydrate-containing clear liquids, protein-containing clear liquids, and chewing gum. They maintained the recommended fasting times from 2017, but added that patients should drink up to 400 milliliters of carbohydrate containing clear liquids until two hours before a procedure. The group was unable to find sufficient evidence to recommend drinking protein containing clear liquids until two hours before a procedure, and suggested that a procedure shouldn't be delayed if the patient is found to be chewing gum right before it. 
Of note, the American Society of Anesthesiologists identifies healthy patients who are undergoing elective procedures as the target population, excluding those with coexisting diseases or conditions that can affect gastric emptying or otherwise increase risk of aspiration. Clinicians should therefore adjust the recommended fasting time using their clinical judgment for patients with esophageal disorders, previous gastric surgery, hiatal hernia, gastroparesis, pregnancy, and for emergency procedures. Last but not least, the guidelines are for patients who are set to undergo general anesthesia, regional anesthesia, or procedural sedation and analgesia. This means they don't apply to patients who undergo procedures with no anesthesia or only local anesthesia, which involves a small part of the body and doesn't increase risk of aspiration. Other notable groups to offer recommendations for preoperative fasting include the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care, the American Society for Enhanced Recovery and Perioperative Medicine, the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, or ERAS Society, the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons and the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, and the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism. All of these groups are in agreement with the American Society of Anesthesiologists to give clear liquids until two hours before an elective procedure in healthy patients undergoing general anesthesia, regional anesthesia, or sedation. The European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care, the American Society for Enhanced Recovery and Perioperative Medicine, the ERAS Society, the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons and the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, and the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism also endorse the provision of carbohydrate-containing clear liquids for these patients. One difference in their practice guidelines is that some state carbohydrate-containing liquids should be avoided in patients with diabetes, some state they should be allowed, and some offer no guidance at all. Another difference is that the recommended volume of liquids and amount of carbohydrate isn't always described. The most direct recommendation comes from the American Society for Enhanced Recovery and Perioperative Medicine, who encourages 50 grams of carbohydrate consumed over 5 to 10 minutes, 2 to 3 hours before surgery. While there's seemingly a lack of consensus in these two areas, there's a very strong consensus that not all patients need to be NPO after midnight for a procedure. I couldn't find a single professional organization that actively supports that approach. Based on my own experience and discussions with other providers, it seems the recommendation for NPO after midnight remains widespread. However, I wasn't able to locate any research from the past 10 years that assessed the attitudes and practices of clinicians in the United States. The only relevant study from the United States that I did find was published in 2008 by Crenshaw and Winslow. Using data from 275 patients, they found the average fasting time for liquids was 11 hours, with 40% of patients fasting from liquids for 12 hours or more. Meanwhile, the average fasting time for solids was 14 hours. More recently, a 2020 multi-center audit from the United Kingdom found an average fast of 4.9 hours for clear liquids and 15.6 hours for solids in a group of 266 patients undergoing elective surgery. Although it's impossible to draw conclusions with such a small sample size and data from two different countries, these findings suggest that the adoption of recommendations from organizations like the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care and the American Society of Anesthesiologists remains limited. Future research should be directed at better understanding average fasting times and the attitudes and practices of clinicians in the United States. This will help to see how closely practice guidelines are being followed and identify the barriers that exist for their implementation.
In conclusion, preoperative fasting is necessary for patients undergoing anesthesia to minimize the risk of aspiration. Nevertheless, not every patient has to be NPO after midnight for this to be achieved. Rather than leaning on NPO after midnight because it's easy to convey and convenient for scheduling, clinicians and medical institutions should work toward creating policies that embrace current practice guidelines. By assigning a more specific preoperative fasting time to each patient, we can enhance their well-being and ability to recover from surgery. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to download the companion piece by following the links in the video description.